really 3 through 10, then salt and light, verses 13 to 16, the relationship to the old law, verses 17 to 20, and now a brand new, a brand new scope of thinking that's actually going to extend all the way through verse 48. In other words, what Jesus, not, not subject-wise, but theme-wise. Right? You're going to find about, I think about seven times in, this, in these next few texts, the phrase, you've heard it said, but I say. And then some of them say, you have heard it said to those of old time, but I say. Or you have heard it said, but I say. And this goes all the way through the end of chapter 5. Right? Such as what we're going to study today is you have heard it said you know, by those of old time, uh, thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not murder. The word there, kill, means murder. If you study the Old Testament, uh, th that's the word. And there are, there, are different words for, there are different words for killing, such as killing an animal, for murder, such as uh, 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 killing a, an innocent human being, uh, also uh, manslaughter or manslayer. You know, there's, the, the, the language is rich enough, that, but a lot of times people get confused. They, they say things like, well, how's the Bible say, you know, thou shalt not kill, and then Leviticus 17 to 20 issues about 25 25 crimes or penalties that are all punishable by death. And the, and the reason is the person doesn't understand the difference in killing a person and executing judgment on an individual. Uh, you know, murder, you know, murder is, the, is, the, is the willful taking of innocent human life. And to execute a criminal is not, <laughs> is not the willful taking of life of an innocent individual. And so Jesus is entering into a section of, of Old Testament texts, but he's going to give them a New Testament spin. And by spin, I don't mean spin in that, in that he's, he's wanting you to understand them differently. Jesus is, fi Listen, I mean, I'm just going to be straight up with you. Jesus is fixing to make it real hard. For people to live according to the New Testament. You know, because a lot of the things that were in the Old Testament, you had to be guilty by actually doing them. But in the New Testament, you're guilty by thinking them. Because you know, we're talking about, you know, you've heard it said to those of old time, uh, 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 thou shalt not uh, murder, thou shalt not kill. But I say to you, He's, and whoever uh, murders is in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whosoever is angry with his brother without cause is in danger of the judgment. And whosoever says uh, to uh, his brother, uh, 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 Rock, I shall be in danger of the council. And whoever says, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So Jesus has, Jesus has made a, a, a vast difference in it. You, know, you, can, you can only be a murderer under the old law if you did what? Murdered somebody. But Jesus says, He that is angry with his brother, no, the, the cause, without cause. Without cause. And then uh, 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 in 1 John chapter 3 and uh, verse 15, it says, that Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life uh, abiding in him. And so Jesus has. has has raised the bar exponentially in how, in how we ought to live, uh, as opposed to the Old Testament, you know, which had 613 thou shouts and thou shalt nots. But Jesus, and, and, and almost all of them had to do with an, with an actual physical action. Now some of them, like covetousness and some of those things, uh, some of those things that, that were in the Old Testament were matters of the heart, but most of them were matters of the hands, you know, matters of, 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 of the mouth. Jesus, did, Jesus goes to the very heart of the matter. If you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're, you're a murderer. If you hate your brother, you're a murderer. John went on to say in the next chapter in 1 John 4, it says, how can, a man hate his, how can a man love God whom he has not seen and hate his brother whom he has seen? It says that doesn't even make sense. It says, He that would love God must love his brother also. There in uh, 1 John 4 uh, and about verse uh, 20. And so Jesus is, Jesus is setting a tone here in these next five verses where he talks, about, he talks about anger, he talks about lust, he talks about divorce, he talks about oaths, he talks about loving your enemies. I mean, over and over and over again, Jesus is going. Jesus is going to set. He's going to set a standard, a higher standard for us as His children than those that lived under the Old Testament. 
And so he says uh, in verse 23, the word therefore. Now he's talking, about, he's talking about our relationship with our brother. And he says, therefore, in other words, in view of this, if you bring your gift to the altar, and he's talking about worship. That's what bringing your gift to the altar is a reference to. It's worship. So if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift there in verses uh, 23 and 24. And he says, agree with your adversary quickly while you are in the way with him, lest your adversary uh, deliver you uh, to, uh, to the officer or the judge, the officer hand you over to, or the, the judge hand you over to the officer, and then you be cast into prison. It says, for assuredly I say to you, you will by no means get out of there until you have repaid the last penny. In other words, Jesus is even telling us how to get along with people that are not, that are not our, our brethren. In other words, do every, in other words, do everything you can, do everything you can to to be, as Paul said in Romans 14, 19, uh, as much as lies within you, live at peace with all men. And get even your adversaries. And by the way, if you ever, I don't know if you noticed this or not, in the last section here in verses 25 and 26, the Christians at fault. It says, agree with your adversary while you're on the way with him. Because when he says, you will not get out until you've paid the last penny, that means you're guilty, right? <laughs> and, and, so, and so, especially when we're at fault, and especially when we're at fault in regard to those who are our adversaries. Johnny. That's right. I mean, you know, at, you know, look, having an enemy, having an enemy is, is inevitable. Yeah. But but making an enemy, or is not inevitable, so to speak. Or and we're told to you know if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. You know, in other words, we're to, we're to treat all men as if we as we want to be treated, whether they're as lack of a better term, friend or foe, friend or foe. And so and so Jesus begins this section about uh, about anger. Uh, uh, note on uh, note in verse. 22 after it says whosoever murders you've heard it said that whosoever murders will be in danger of the judgment he says but i say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause is in danger of the judgment whoever says to his brother rock i shall be in danger of the council and whoever says thou fool shall be in danger uh in danger of hell fire now the word there uh the reference there uh to a uh, uh, fool you may have a you may have a, a, a margin note a margin note there. Uh, I remember, uh, matter of fact, I think I got a copy of it right there. My old King James I've got there says "graceless wretch," and I think the implication is there that you're be, to say to him you're beyond you're beyond the scope of even God's help is what he's talking about because it's not just talking about using the term fool because because. All through the old, the New Testament, even old and the New Testament, you know, I mean, the Bible says people are fools. It says they are foolish, uh, and so and so it's not to be taken in an abs, you know, in an absolute sense. It uh, to 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 say that a person's a fool. I mean, you know, the fool has said in his heart, "There is no God." Right? Does that mean an atheist is beyond is beyond the reach of the gospel of Christ? No. No, lots of atheists have come to faith in, through the course of history, and so and so what you know the the the, the implication in the context is whatever you're saying to this person that is rendered fool, the way you're saying it and what you imply by it essentially makes you a murderer because it 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 implies or I think it implies the idea that that we would have such a terrible attitude toward an individual to say that, that we wouldn't do anything that we could to help them. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, because, it, look, if, if... You're passing judgment. That's exactly right. That's what I'm getting at. I'm passing judgment that this person is beyond help, this person is beyond... Right. We're just supposed to know what Right, and now, obviously, there are some, uh, there are some, qual not qualifications to the judgment part, 
but qualifications to how we deal with people. Let me give you an example. And this is one I, that I, this is what I'm dealing with, even at not this very minute, but even up to this morning. I was on a podcast on Tuesday with the Tony Brewer, the guy we support up in Canada, and we were we were discussing uh, the doctrine of faith only. And about an hour and twenty minutes. Well, it wasn't long after that podcast was over, I got a a, a messenger message from a guy I'd never heard of, and it said he wanted to ask me a question. So I just responded back. So you know how that works when you respond back. Now, now you can communicate back and forth through Messenger, even if you're not connected on Facebook. And so he, he asked some questions, and I answered those questions. Well, then those questions just brought more questions and more questions and more questions. And I just kept answering and answering and answering and answering. And then it, it digressed into a personal attack on Tony based on a gross misunderstanding of the Scriptures. Hold on a second, Jimmy. And, and, uh, and so, and I answered that. And this morning, after I answered that, early this morning, here's what I said. Here's what I said to him. I said, listen, man. I said, I'm a full-time gospel preacher. I'm an elder. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a grandfather. I work in the community. You know, I try to keep my house up. I try to keep my farm up. I work from house to house, heart to heart. You know, I got a lot of things going on. So I've spent a lot of time. I've spent a lot of time in the last five days answering your questions, and all I seem to get is more more questions, and now nothing but accusations. So I said, "Is this the way you, you know, is this the way you deal with everybody that you reach out to?" So because you know, basically, I'm telling him if if this is how this is going to go. To quote the great philosopher Sweet Brown, ain't nobody got time for that. You know, you know, you know I gave that guy four or five hours of my time the latter part of this week, and, and, and man, I don't think I have to defend my schedule to y'all. I think y'all know I, I stay pretty busy. You know, if a, but if a person's interested in asking questions and, and, and being, you know, having an honest dialogue, man, I'll spend all night with you. But, you know, but if all you want to do is ask more questions, then when I give you the Scripture that answers that question and refutes what you think, and then you want to jump to another thing without ironing out both, I don't have time for that. And, and, so, you know, and, so the, and I said all that to say that sometimes we've got to cut people loose. You've got to cut them loose. I mean, by the, way, the Bible tells us that. In 1 Timothy, in Titus, you know, it tells us, look, you do all that you can, but when people, but when people refuse to be taught or, or refuse to engage in honest dialogue or refuse to change, you've got to cut them loose. You can't, you know, it's like, um, it's like sometimes, and, and I, I hate to make this equivocation, but I think you guys will understand what I mean, you know. I'm of the field and all this guy wants to do is argue. That, I think that's all he wants to do is argue. Now look, he might prove me wrong because I asked him a question and if he can answer that question properly, then I'll, learn, I'll know that he's interested in honest dialogue. But if not, I'm going to cut him loose. But, you know, but, you know, but sometimes we've got people in our lives that we've got to cut loose. And it don't mean we don't love them. But you know, you know I had, you know, I don't know that ever cut him loose in the absolute sense, but I've had, you know, people in my family that just want to keep making bad decisions all the time. And I can't help them. You know, I can try to help them. You know, I did try to help them. You know, try to bail them out of bad, you know, bad choices, bad decisions, encourage them to make good decisions. But, you know, 99 times out of four, given a bad choice of a bad decision and a good one, they're going to choose the bad one every time. It's like, they're like the people in the book of Hosea. When Hosea said, my people are bent to backsliding from me. Bent. Now, we, we use that in southern language, right? He's bent that way. She's bent that way. Right? Now, now what does that mean? It means that's the way they're inclined. And, and, they've, been, and they've been inclined that way so long, they don't, know how, they don't even know how to do right. It's like, a, I always use this as an example because we can all understand this. All the trees where my buddy Toby Secting lives in Texas, all the trees there lean north. They all lean north because the predominant wind through the spring and summer is out of the south. 
And so while those trees have leaves on them, they're being blown continually. Look, when I talk about the wind blowing in Texas, I don't mean it blows for an hour or two. The wind in Texas blows all the time. I mean, you, mean you, you don't learn how to play golf in Texas like you do in Alabama. You've got to learn how to play in the wind in Texas, all right? So all the trees are being blown from daylight to dark, all day, north, 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 north. Then the fall comes and the trees lose their leaves. Then the wind comes out of the where? North, but there's no leaves on the trees to catch the wind to reverse the process. So what happens? They all lean north all the time. By the way, the Indians used to do this in this part of the country. They'd tie trees in certain directions and tie them off as signals and directions. They'd tie that tree and eventually, you, by the way, you know, if you plant a tree and you don't get it straight, you let it grow long enough, it's bent and you'll never straighten it up again. And there's people that are like that. You can do all that you can to help them. And, and by the way, and just because you got to cut them loose don't mean you quit loving them. But you know, but sometimes, you know, but so, you know, sometimes as Jesus told his disciples, you just got to shake the dust off your feet and go on because you realize you realize you're only spinning your wheels with this individual. You know, no matter what you do for them, things are things are not going things are not going to change. You know, most of the you know, most of the time this works with parents and children, right? You know, that, that parents just keep feeding their kids bad habits, thinking they're going to change and they never change. But sometimes it works the other way, like with my dad. You know, my dad, you know, he was just bent, he was just bent to do it wrong. And it was, and there, you know, and look, even in the face of death, you know, my dad got a 30 day death sentence. I actually got a three, a three to six month death sentence, but he died in 30 days. But after he got a three to six month death sentence, I went and tried to talk to him. And you know what? He still didn't want to do right. He still didn't want to do right. What am I going to do with him? I mean, the man's been told straight up, you are going to die. And you go talk to him and you beg him and you plead with him. And he still don't want, he don't want to do right. You just gotta, you just gotta accept that, that you know, that in, in, in thirty days I can't do, I can't undo forty eight years of wrong living. You know, he, you know he's got, he's got to want to do it. I can't, I can't help him. I can't force him. And so, you know, as we think about, as we think about some of these concepts about our relationships, we want to, we want to understand Jesus knows about all of these contingencies that we think about, right? He knows all these things. I mean, you know, Jesus was patient, Jesus was loving, Jesus was kind. You know, but Jesus didn't go chase that rich young ruler down. He told him what he needed to know. The Bible even says in Mark's account, Jesus looked at him and loved him. He says, one thing you like, go and sell what you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me and you'll have treasure in heaven. Man went away sorrowful. Why? He esteemed the treasures of earth as greater than the treasures of Christ. He was the antithesis of Moses who esteemed the, that the, the reproaches of Jesus as greater than the treasures of Egypt. And so, and so you know, as we think, of, you know, we think about these things, you know, we want to understand that, 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 there are, that, that Jesus understands all these other, all these other well, I, I hate to call them contingencies, but you know what I mean. That, that no, there's no one size pattern fits all for every, every situation. And so Jesus is talking about Jesus is talking about our at, the attitudes that we have in our hearts. All right, and you know, yeah. if uh, Jesus came back today and told all people to sell what they have and give them more, that's where you're going to see a few in every time. That would be that would be true, but it, but in this particular case, Jesus, knowing the hearts of all men, knew what that young man's problem was. You know. The young man was what Satan accused Job of being. Remember, Job served the Lord. He offered up sacrifices for all ten of his kids. I mean, he, Job was a great man. But what did Satan say? Satan said, Job is only serving you because you just keep feeding him money. <laughs> man, he's the richest man in all the land. Anybody would serve you under those conditions. Of course, God knew what Job was made of. And he permitted Satan to take what he had. And he permitted Satan to take his family. And he permitted Satan to take, take his health. 
But in the case of the rich young ruler, Jesus knew that man. He knew his heart. And he knew the one thing that was keeping him from serving him. Right? By the way, did Jesus really ask him to do anything that the apostles hadn't done? Had Jesus asked him to do anything that thousands of people hadn't already done when they just pulled up stakes and they followed Jesus all over listening to him preach? Jesus wasn't asking that man to do anything. Anything, and certainly nothing that was bad for him. Did Jesus ask him to do anything that Zacchaeus didn't do when he saw Jesus? See, Jesus understood what, if I might use this term right, Jesus understood the black, the, this black spot he had in his heart. And the black spot he had in his heart concerned his riches. And Jesus knew that. I mean, Jesus promised him treasures, right? Did he promise him treasures? He did. He did. But he didn't have enough faith to see it. And so, and so, uh, you know, and, by, and that's an interesting thing, Mr. Bob, you know, talk about selling all that you have. The, you know, all those types of commandments are, are, are person specific. In other words, those things are not demanded of us. But if they were, we need to be willing to do it. Johnny. Yeah. Yeah, when he called them to follow him, they just... ...of failure, and he said, go back out and let your net down on this side. Yeah. And they did and had the largest catch. They had to get somebody to help them because they almost sank the boat. Yep. And immediately he told them, leave this and follow me. Leave this and follow me. Their biggest catch, and they just walked away from it. Yep, that's, and that's a, great, that's a great point. Can I add something to that? Just, in, just while we're off chasing this rabbit? James and John's dad was fixing to lose his best help. They worked for their dad, right? And he's fixing, he's fixing, he's fixing to take their his best help and leave him somewhat in the lurch, right? So, but what did he do when he left him in the lurch? He left him with the biggest catch of his career. In other words, he he left him in a situation that it wasn't detrimental to Zebedee for James and John to leave him. In other words, he, he had this great catch which, which, would carry, which would have carried him along in his business long enough to find somebody that. I mean, there's a, man, there's so much in that, in, just in that little old four or five verses. It's incredible to, to, to think about. But, you know, you're talking about them leaving. You know, in the very instance of the rich young ruler, when he refused to follow Jesus, they said, we have left all and followed you. So what are we going to get? Hey, ask him that. We've left all and followed you. What are we going to get? He said, you're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He promised them what? He promised them exaltation. He promised them, you know, he promised them a position. And they, had enough, and they had enough faith in Jesus to keep going forward. And, and the rich young ruler didn't, didn't, have, didn't have enough. All right, uh, I want to look at... Uh, um, I really want to introduce the next. Uh, I really want to introduce the next section because um, um, these five verses. You know, we've pretty well exhausted what's in these five verses so far as understanding what Jesus' intent is. And so let me just uh, let me just do this because I want to introduce these, this next section uh, of uh, of scripture. Let me see here. I'm going to look at the questions real quickly. Yeah, we've already addressed all. We've already addressed all the questions. So I want to just introduce the the the, the text of Lesson Plan Twenty Five. The text of Lesson Plan Twenty Five, and that begins in verse twenty seven and goes through verse uh, thirty two. Twenty seven through thirty two. By the way, if, if all goes well, I will preach on verses 31 and 32, Lord willing, next Sunday. Um, just kind of give you a little bit of background. Uh, you've been reading in the bulletin about Wesley Hazels holding our fall meeting in October. And I've been listening, of course, Wesley's a good friend of mine, uh, uh, and I've listened to a lot of his sermons on PTP 365. And one of them I've been listening to he hit me right between the eyes. 
hit me right between the eyes. He said, uh, he said, when's the last time you preached on the fundamentals? And he's preaching to, I mean, there's literally 3,000 people in the audience. You know, a lot of them are preachers. He says, when's the last time you preached on fundamentals? He said, you know, because if it's been, he says, if it's been more than three or four years since you've preached on fundamentals, you've got kids that started high school that are fixing to leave high school that ain't never heard it. I thought, man, he's right. He is right. And, and so when I heard that, I decided then I was going to start a series on fundamentals, which starts today, by the way. But this particular text in Matthew 5, 31, 32 is already on my schedule for next Sunday, assuming I get through all my material today, which as many of you know, is iffy. All right, let's look at verse 27 through 32. Jesus says, You've heard it is said of old of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it's more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it's more profitable for you that one of your members should perish than your whole body be cast into hell. Furthermore, it's been said, whosoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whosoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality or fornication causes her to commit adultery and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery now back to verse 27 we're still dealing with the same issue right a matter of action matter of the heart you know how did you know what did you have to do to be an adulterer in the first, in, under the old law what'd you have to do don't I don't I don't want you what are, wipe that smile off your face I don't, I don't want a literal description. I, I want... You had, to, you, had to, you had to commit adultery. You know, there's a physical act involved. All right. I know exactly what you were thinking. That's why I called Everybody you down. Else did too. I know. You had to commit adultery to be an adulterer. But what's Jesus say you got to do to commit adultery? Think it. Think it. Whosoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, now, I do not believe that anybody could make the case that the, that the thought action is sufficient for divorce. I think the text, I think the text uh, in Matthew 5, 31 and 32, certainly the text in Matthew 19, 9, uh, also, that the parallel to it in Mark 10, 11, and 12, and what, uh, and what Paul attributed to the Lord in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, 10, and 11, all, all require the act and not the thought. And by the way, you say, well, why would you say that? Because in 20 years of answering questions for house to house, heart to heart, I can't tell you how many women have, have sent questions in asking if they can divorce their husbands for a pornography problem. And it happens a lot. And I and I you know, I don't I don't think that I don't think that bears I don't think that I don't think that meets the standard that Jesus set uh, that Jesus set here uh, or in, in Matthew five, Matthew nineteen or first Corinthians seven, uh, ten and eleven. I think when Jesus is talking about a divorce for sexual immorality. I think he's talking about he's talking about an, an act that has to take place. What he's saying in verses twenty seven and twenty eight is you've got to guard your heart. You've got to guard your heart. Uh, and he speaks specifically, first of all, about your eyes. Right? If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Now, let me ask you: you Think Jesus means for you to literally pluck your eyeballs out? I don't think so. It's hyperbole. Hyperbole is an, is an intended exaggeration. What Jesus is saying here is, you better do everything in your power to guard your heart. And by the way, the eye, is, the eye seems to be, if I, might, uh, if I might make a pun, the eye always seems to be the focal point of our sins. Right? With regard to adultery in this case, looks upon her. 
You know, what, you know, and in Matthew 6, when Jesus talks about laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven and not on earth, he says, the lamp or the light of the body is the eye. And if your eye is good, your body's full of light. If your eye is bad, your, bo your body is full of darkness. You know, over in, 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 uh, in uh, Peter's epistles, he says, they have eyes full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin. You know, where does the sin of covetousness arise? It's in the eye, right? I, you know, I see a thing. You know, I see a thing. That's why I always say, like when me and uh, uh, Neil, Neil uh, Moore and I were running yesterday, and, and here's how I always say it, because I saw a guy, I saw a guy cutting a cutting a hay field or a, a pasture with a nice tractor with a cab on it and about a it looked like about a 25 foot bat wing. And here's what I said: I said, I wish I had that tractor and bat wing, and he had a brand new one. See, that way I'm not covetous. See, I want him to have one better. I'd like to have that, but I, only, only if he gets one better, right? So, so I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not covetous by saying I hope he has a new one. I need that one, and I hope he has a new one, you see? And so, but, you know, covetous begin, you know, covetousness begins in the eye. You know, we see somebody's house. We see somebody's car. We see, you know, we see somebody's playthings, you know, their, their toys, so to speak. And, and we become envious and covetous. Uh, we become resentful. But where did it all start? It all started in our eyes. It all started in our eyes. And by the way, uh, you know, the idea that Jesus conveys here uh, about our, our bodies being filled with light or darkness is interesting because Jesus basically says, whatever you let into your eyes reflects who you are. Whatever I let into my eyes reflects who I am. And he said, if your light, if your eye is good, your body's filled with light. But if your body, if your eye is bad, your body is filled with darkness. In other words, if you allow your eyes to let darkness in, then it's just going that darkness is just going to keep pouring in and pouring in and pouring in. And he says, and if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now let me explain what that what that means. Now, mostly here lately, I've been wearing blue suits. Now they're pretty dark, but some of y'all know I got some. Y'all know I got some suits that are about this dark, right? If I was if I was invited to some type of uh, some type of affair hosted by Scott Hunt that would require a seersucker suit, white suit, you know, summertime event, and Hunt and, and Hunt says, "All right, you're invited. You need to wear you need to wear your lightest your lightest colored suit." And I show up. And my suit looks like this, for those that are watching online, all right? And Hunt says to me, man, I told you to wear your lightest colored suit. And what if I told him, dude, that is my lightest colored suit. And I've got 20 suits. What do you know my closet looks like? Black hole, right? In other words, if that's my lightest suit, how dark is my darkest suit? And Jesus is saying... If this, is, if this is what qualifies as light in your life, in your body, in your mind, if this is the light that you have, man, how dark is that? How, 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 dark, how dark is a person, how dark is a person who only allows that kind of stuff to get into their eyes? I mean, everybody and everything they look at is, is with a dark eye. And they just continually fill themselves with darkness, darkness, darkness. You know, those are the kind of you know, those are the kind of people that you know cut your legs out from under you, right? You know, that's your Tanya Hardings. You know, they'll kneecap you if they think it'll get them get them on the on the skating rink. Some y'all y'all some of y'all not remembering Tanya Harding, but okay. But so you you know what I'm saying? You know, you know the, the people you know the people that will the people that will do to others the, the most vile and vicious of things are the people that only allow darkness into their eyes. You know, and that's why I keep you know all the time at PTP and other places I'm talking to young people, especially young men. I said boys, you got to watch your eyes. Watch your eyes. I said you know if you see you know you know you live out here in the world. Right? I and mean, we all have to live in the world, you know. And there's going to be, you know, there's going to be women that are, you know, walking out in public, and they ain't wearing enough clothes. You know, when you see that, 
You turn your head the other way. You find somewhere else to go. You, know, you don't sit there and watch it walk by or turn and watch it walk away. You turn your head. You, know, you, don't, you, know, you, don't invite, you don't invite the type of thing into your mind that, that Jesus is not going to be happy with you. And by the way, that ain't just young men. You know, you know that that's goes for us old dudes too. Is that right, Woodard? Yes, sir. I mean, you know, like somebody talk, talk about some some young beautiful woman. You know, if I was to say something about, and I don't mean this in any inordinate way, but I say, man, I mean, I mean, she's a beautiful woman, and somebody says, man, you ought not talk like that. So listen, dude, I'm old, but I ain't blind. You know. You know, but just the fact, just because I can recognize a person as beautiful doesn't mean that I'm lusting after them, right? I mean, I, I think we can all un understand that distinction. But, but I have, well, I'll just tell you, uh, at, at the ball games and stuff, a lot of y'all know I sit, I'm at the main table at the, at the ball games and whatnot, and when them girls come on and perform, I'm out of there. I'm out of there. I ain't got no interest in that. And I don't want anybody to think I got an interest in that. You know, if you want to let your kids parade around half naked in front of a bunch of strangers, that, that's your business. But I ain't gonna sit there and watch it, and I don't want people. I don't want people to think I'm watching. It. And you know, and I do. Look, I do that for my benefit. I do it for my wife's benefit. I do it for. Yeah, that continuous thought is is. That's right. You just keep putting it in there. It's not good. All right. Uh, lesson plan twenty five next week on twenty seven to thirty two.